Welcome back to Two Keto Dudes. This is Carl Franklin from Connecticut in the United States. And in February 2016, I put myself on a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. In two and a half months, I managed to reverse all my markers of type 2 diabetes with diet alone. As of now, I'm 70 pounds lighter with no signs of diabetes or heart disease. Hi, I'm Richard Morris in Canberra, Australia. I've been on a ketogenic diet for over two years. When I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. Within six months of starting a ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. I've also lost about 70 pounds and have completely turned my health around. And this show is a document of my progress through ketosis and Richard's experience thriving for years in ketosis. Yeah. And hopefully that might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. We're not doctors. We don't want to give anyone any medical advice, but we are keen to share our own experiences. We're actually both software developers, so we're not afraid of a little technical detail, are we, Carl? Nah. (laughs) Nah. So we've done some research into our own deranged metabolisms and the science behind them. We hope to share some of that research. Where possible, we intend to put links in the show notes to cite research supporting any claims that we make. You'll probably work out pretty quickly that we're both foodies. We love to cook and we love to eat. Yeah. So we share the great food we can eat on this diet. And every episode, both of us share a recipe for an essential keto meal that we eat on a regular basis. Sure do. So let's start podcast episode number 23, Keto on a Budget. Richard, do we have any corrections or apologies from last week? Yeah, I I wasn't sure of the units that my fasting insulin was measured in. One of the advantages of living in both the US and Australia for an extended period of time is I've become entirely messed up on imperial metric units. So <laughs> uh, anyway, I looked it up and the correct unit uh, of measurement is milli units uh, of, uh, per litre, so M- MU slash L. Okay, and also, I mentioned that a ketogenic diet is specifically good for rheumatoid arthritis. In fact, of the two markers tested, it only lowered one, but fasting was shown to lower both. So, it may well be that fasting, which we know is easier if you're adapted to a ketogenic diet, might be your best strategy to deal with rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Hey, speaking of our show, some new things have happened. First of all, let me just give everybody some... Uh, statistics. The number one show is still the fasting show. And yeah. since that came out, it's been downloaded over 38,000 times. Wow. This, and that was show number five. Yeah. So incredible. people are clearly mostly interested in fat. I, I chalk that up to the fact that it's sort of new science, you know? Yeah, sure. Uh, the second most popular show is Nina's show, The Big Fat Surprise. That was episode number 20. That comes in at about 37,000. Wow. So that's Pretty awesome. Yeah, that was one of my favorites. Oh, definitely mine too. After that comes Eating Patterns with about 33,000. And The Newbies Show with my daughter, Emmeline, oh, is yeah. number four at 32,000. For the next, most of them uh, are in the 18,000 up range. So there you go. That's awesome, Carl. Yeah, that's awesome. People are listening. It's good to know. But they're also joining our Facebook group. We yeah. have over 1,400 members now. Wow. And you can join too. Go to fb.2keto.com. And we have some new website graphics, which I'm proud of. <laughs> <laughs> Small non scale victory there. And yeah. also, uh, we have a new t shirt company that also does coffee mugs and notebooks and iPod or iPhone covers or phone cases. Merch. Yeah, and a lot of stuff like that. So, if you want to get your gear on, go to gear.2keto.com. The t-shirts that we have available say, keep calm and keto on. They yep. say, show me the science. <laughs> and the third one says, go fast yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to get one of the, the show me the science ones to, to wear to my doctors. Absolutely. Well, it turns out it worked. So, y- yeah. we, might as well, we might as well talk about how we're doing. Yeah, yeah. How are you doing, Carl? So, I had a uh, doctor visit and took my A1C and it's 5.9. Wow. That means you're you're non-diabetic, not even pre-diabetic. Yeah, that's below pre-diabetes in the United States anyway. Yeah. I think the UK, it's uh, 5.7 and in Australia, it's uh, it's, uh, 6.0 as well. So, Mm. that's outstanding. Yeah, it's outstanding. And, you know, she basically said... uh, 
I, I'm no longer concerned about anything that, you know, you uh, uh, might might be going on with heart disease or wow. cholesterol. Just keep doing what you're doing. She said, you're walking proof that it's healthy because wow. we can't find anything wrong with you. Yeah. Congratulations. That's an outstanding result. Yeah, it certainly is. You do realize it's impossible, don't you? <laughs> yeah. She said, I, she said, that's amazing. Even a one point shift in A1C is equivalent to like, you know, a hundred uh, in g- blood glucose. Yeah. And in terms of risk of all of the nasty complications of diabetes, any shift down of your HbA1c is a significant decrease of, uh, of relative risk um, uh, yep. in getting you know foot amputations, cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, dialysis. Uh, um, there's another one. Blindness is another one. So all of these horrible mm. things, the, the higher your HbA1c is, the, the higher your risk is of, ha- of those things happening. So um, it's an outstanding result. It really is good. Yeah. So there's more to it. I said, mm. um, you know, obviously curing diabetes is a big deal and you probably don't see that very often with people on drugs. And, yeah. and I said, you know, I don't think doctors are evil. I just think that you guys have no incentive to learn about uh, nutrition and how to how to control diabetes with diet because, you know, and, and she interrupted me. She says, well, the yeah. reason is the, re- the biggest reason, she said, is because most people just want to take a pill. Yeah. And you you say, look, you can beat this by eating and changing your lifestyle and they won't do it. Yeah. So they can preach a ketogenic diet all they want to. And people would rather eat their ice cream and, you know, sandwiches or whatever and uh, take a pill and hope for the best. Right. Unfortunately. It's a shame. We need to educate people on the the outcomes if you don't uh, if you don't manage and keep control of your glucose. So, exactly, yeah, and so. I and I said, you know, I couldn't have done it without a community. And if you have any patients who are sort of at that level that are ready to to take control but don't know how, here, give them my card, and I gave her a stack of cards. And she said, you know what, I'm awesome. going to put a stack of these in every single exam room. She says she's already got two people that she wants to refer to me. Wow. <laughs> and refer to me. I know the doctor's referring to a programmer. I know. <laughs> but, you know, it's outstanding, just for the it? community. It's, yeah. Yeah. So how are you doing, buddy? I'm doing fine. I think my flu is mostly gone. I've got a little bit of phlegm yeah. happening, but I just did a 55K bike ride today and that generally sort of uh, blows out all of the detritus in my system. So I'm feeling great <laughs> after it, you know. Uh, other than having the flu and getting over it, that's about it for me. But, uh, you know, I've had, a, I've had a good week. I haven't put on any weight, so that's a good thing. Oh, yeah, I haven't either. I'm still under 300 pounds. Awesome. So I'm having a good time. Well, that's the other thing that people tell you is, you know, once you lose weight, they, they all wag their finger and say, oh, it'll come back again, won't it? Well, so far yeah. it hasn't, <laughs> and it's not. It's amazing. I, well, you know, the, the food that we eat is just so good. Yeah. Why would you stop eating it? So. <laughs> Oh, my, 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 my. It's outstanding. Well, now that we know who we are and how we're doing, <laughs> let's talk to other people. It's time for... Mail! Mail! Mail. 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 <laughs> so the first mail we've got is from Dana, and uh, she writes in our Facebook group, OMG, the energy. The mm. other day I went to a concert. It was a fun mix of old British 80s bands. Howard Jones was as great as ever. Wow. I was just so happy and excited to be there, jumping up and down and dancing at the foot of the stage. I completely forgot to eat dinner. And this was a venue where you bring a picnic basket and wine. It was hot. The music was great. I was being one of those kind of people, <laughs> crazy endless energy. And there's at least one in every crowd, right? And you're always thinking, oh, they must have some good drugs. <laughs> <laughs> well, she just kept, she says, I just kept dancing and dancing. And finally, when there was a break to switch bands, I decided to eat. I noticed a remarkable shift in energy after I ate. The food was all keto appropriate, but afterwards I just didn't feel so enthusiastic anymore. For the future, I'll remember skipping a meal may actually serve to access more energy. Absolutely. As a former sugar burner, this would not have been possible. I see now how somebody could do a 50K bike ride in a fasting state. 
What a beautiful thing to see my body doing much more than I thought it could. Wonderful. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. And it, that energy really, it, it's obvious when it happens to you. Yeah, it, it's amazing. I've, I've experienced the same thing that you don't want to stop when you're constantly uh, depleting your fat stores, uh, yeah. you know, in a fasting state. Um, again, I can't talk about fasting without the disclaimer, um, which is a lot of people think fasting is a magic bullet, you know, that they can just start doing it. And while it does have some amazing, uh, benefits, you really should be fat adapted or at least a couple of weeks into your ketogenic diet oh, sure, yeah. before, before trying it. And it's not that it's going to hurt. Mm. Well, it might hurt. You might get a headache. You might get some weird side effects, but you'll probably be a lot more hungry yeah. and therefore susceptible to uh, getting on the roller coaster. Yeah, exactly. So, so it's probably not a good idea until you can skip a you know a, a meal, two meals, maybe go you know dinner to dinner. Yeah, right. And also, fasting is never appropriate for children who haven't no. fully developed yet. That's right. I I noticed at first. Much like Diana, I noticed ac- accidental fasting. You know, mm. I forgot I forgot yeah. to eat, and then I'm looking back and thinking, whenever have I forgotten to eat? Normally, I've yeah, got right. you know blaring cl- clacks and messages in my head saying you've got to mm. eat, buddy. You know, so um, yeah, that that's normally the first sign of things of you, your fat adaptation is working is that your body can access body fat and. It doesn't worry about telling you you've got to eat something because it's getting energy. Yeah. We just naturally eat less after a while. And that's one of the magic principles of the uh, ketogenic diet is that uh, you you actually eat less. Yeah. All right. So the next message also came from our Facebook group from David Martin. He says, stuff we know, but I found interesting. Had a visit with two medical professionals today, ketoacidosis, blah, blah, blah. So I did a quick search and found this, which I'll email them both. And he links to a study. And this study is is interesting. And I'll let you talk about it. But the conclusions are, quote, the present study shows the beneficial effects of a long-term ketogenic diet. It significantly reduced the body weight and body mass index of the patients. Furthermore, it decreased the level of triglycerides, LDL cholesterol, and blood glucose, and increased the level of HDL cholesterol. Administering a ketogenic diet for a relatively longer period of time did not produce any significant side effects in the patients. Therefore, the present study confirms that it is safe to use a ketogenic diet for a longer period of time than previously demonstrated. And this was 83 obese patients, 39 men and 44 women, with a body mass index greater than 35, which is in kilograms per square meter, and a high glucose and cholesterol level, 24 weeks. Yeah. So you couldn't get much more categoric a statement than that. Yeah. Put people on a ketogenic diet for long term and all of these biomarkers of uh, of uh, disease will, will all remedy themselves. Right. It's incredible. And I, I'm surprised that I I never knew about this uh, this study. Yeah, this study is from when? Twelve years ago? Yeah, two thousand twelve years ago, two thousand and four. It's it's just like it's been buried. It's incredible. So this was eighty three obese patients and they were all obese two, which or greater. So obese two starts at thirty five um a BMI of 35. They basically put on a ketogenic diet for 24 weeks. So that diet consisted of 30 grams of carbohydrates, yeah. one gram of protein per kilo of lean body weight, yeah. and the rest was fat. And it was the ratio of fat they actually uh, detailed was 20% saturated fat and 80% either poly or monounsaturated fat. That's great. That's basically what we say, right? Ketogenic diet. That's exactly what it is. So they said that it lowered total cholesterol, it uh, lowered LDL, it uh, lowered triglycerides, and it raised HDL. And the only, the only, the only point that I would actually make about this, about those results, is that not everybody sees a lowering of LDL. Some people goes That's up, right. some people goes down, some people just stays where it is. So it it really doesn't. And we've spoken about cholesterol in the past, and and sure. the, it's arguable whether LDL is really a meaningful result. My LDL went up, and then I got a carotid artery scan, and there was no placking. So yeah, right, yeah, it just doesn't matter. A potential marker of disease went up, but when you actually looked at the actual disease, it had gone down. So you know. Yeah. So anyway, right. it, it's uh, it's arguable certainly, but but 
so this is a good this is a good paper to take to your doctor. When your doctor asks yeah. more information about the ketogenic diet, you can show them this, and they can see the results that were achieved over twenty four weeks. And then if your results over those twenty 24 weeks uh, in the same ballpark, then I'm sure they'll be a lot more comfortable about this whole ketogenic process. Excellent. And also, last week, I put together a list of critical resources that are just links right. for people who want to get just a, a list in one place of places to go, just stuff to give to your doctor. And if you go to links.2keto.com, that's a blog post on my personal blog where uh, the critical resources are listed. Great. So that's something you can just say. You can just write this down, links.2keto.com. There you go. Yeah. And I'm going to definitely add this to the list. Yeah. No, it's 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 outstanding to be able to to work with your doctor, show show them what the the science that supports what what you're doing. Show them the results as you have done. I mean, you've you got your HbA1c has dropped from what was it? You were in the sevens, right? Yeah, that's right. My A1c was seven point four in September. So I agree. This is a completely great study to show your doctor. Hmm. Also, you need to be ready to defend yourself or ready to defend the ketogenic diet when somebody brings up uh, the Kevin Hall study, for example, which is one that's making the rounds right now. Right. Oh yeah. Well, what about this? This supposedly uh, refutes the benefits of the ketogenic diet. And um, the problem with this study, which we'll publish a link to is remember we were just talking about one of the benefits of going keto is that you naturally get less hungry. You yeah. naturally eat as much as your body wants you to eat and no more. Yeah. And on this study, it appears that the, uh, the same patients ate a high carbohydrate diet for a number of weeks and then switched over to a ketogenic diet. But the food was way too much. I mean, and especially, you know, the the amount of food that they ate was too much. That's a, that's the critical thing about the ketogenic diet is uh, it's all about appetite control, and mm. uh, any diet that doesn't fails to take that into account is uh, is not helping people. It's foolhardy. In, in this particular study, we can we can go into a lot more detail in another show about it. But but uh, essentially, it was a, just a pilot study. It was uh, there was no control, no crossover. Um, no uh, way to tell if the uh, the second diet that was tested, the first diet that was tested was a high carb diet, and then the second diet that was tested was a low carb diet. Mm. And the first, and it was basically four weeks of the high carb diet, four weeks of the low carb diet. Yeah. And there was no control group which would have shown if uh, at the second, if the diet coming in second was metabolically disadvantaged. Uh, there was no, right. there was no crossover to see whether if somebody started first with a, a, a low carb diet and then went to a high carb diet, what the results would have been. Another important thing about it was it was only for four weeks. And if you, yeah. any anybody who's done a ketogenic diet will tell you that in the first four weeks everything is all up in the air. Uh, right. Your body, t your body takes sometimes six six weeks to six months to settle into a rhythm and and uh, and and be efficiently processing fats and yep. and you can see this from the the way it's been presented by the media. Yeah, the the dietitians associations have not had a lot of good news for the past five six years, no. and so they were just so eager. So you'll see all the headlines will be insulin theory is disproved. Well, actually, that's yeah. not the case. So and also we have dozens and dozens and dozens of studies that show the opposite. So. Yeah. I, I, we don't want to go into it now, but just yeah. be prepared to defend that yeah. particular study. Yeah, and, I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to hand back my my 70 pounds that I've lost and go back to being diabetic again just because uh, uh, somebody claims that the, the insulin theory has been disproved. Right. All right. Let's get to the meat of this show, so to yeah. speak. Yeah. Which today is talking about keto on a budget, and sure. this started. In our Facebook group, didn't it? With a message. So this is a, a thread that was started by Lisa in our Facebook group. And she asked, does anyone else have issues with food scarcity, as in being poor? I try to plan. I buy meat in large packages and freeze it. I buy cauliflower at the beginning of the month and make rice and freeze it also. But any time after the 15th of each month, it becomes very scarce. I've gone to food banks, but it's almost all carbs. Luckily on keto, I eat a lot less than two meals a day. So that is helpful. But any suggestions? Yeah. So I gave her a suggestion right off the bat. One is to buy some kosher salt and buy cheap 
tough steaks. Right. So the cheapest you can find and you know, London broil is one such cut, uh, round and chuck mm. are usually uh, cheaper. And you can completely cover the meat in salt and refrigerate it overnight. And you wash off the salt. And what happens is it tenderizes the meat. And I talked about this on another show. Yeah. I but it that. turns it into this sort of buttery, tender meat and, and, and very tasty, of course, because everybody knows salty beef is wonderful. And so then you can fry that in butter or oil over low heat, you know, and the, the slower cooking also um, is, is good. Uh, eggs are also a cheap source of protein, especially yeah. if you can find a farm or a neighbor with chickens. Or you can grow, or you can have your own chickens. Right. In her case, she couldn't have her own chickens because she lives in a city. Yeah. Um, but uh, also go to the butcher and ask for fat scraps. I've done this before. Yeah, and so have I. you have to get just establish a good relationship with your local butcher and say, you know, you could say I have a dog, uh, you know, and I, I basically want your your ends of stuff that. You know, no, you know, sometimes they'll sell tea for two bucks a pound or less. Yeah. I find that with my butcher, uh, he's just impressed that somebody's eating meat on a regular basis and yeah. it's, it's his, it's his business. So he loves to talk about it. So if you go to your butcher and say, look, I'm, I want to, I want to get uh, a cheap cut of meat. Uh, what do you suggest? He's probably going to have some good suggestions for you. Absolutely. The, the thing is that because we're ketogenic, we don't really fear fat, so we don't need somebody to spend a lot of time butchering it to trim out all the fat and spending time and wages on processing that meat. We just, well, in my in my case, I went to the butcher the other day and I said that I wanted some plate, which is a, a rarely used cut. Uh, it's the belly of a, of a cow. Hmm. I'm going to make beef bacon out of it, and um, and I said, I, I all I want is I don't want it trimmed. I don't want. Uh, uh, just take the bone off, take the skin off. Um, they don't get uh, beef carcasses with uh, skin on anyway. Mm. Um, but, um, you know, don't trim the fat out because uh, the more fat, the better for me. Yeah. And, uh, and so I'm going to, I'm going to make my own beef bacon out of that. So, um, but it, it, it pays to strike up a, a relationship with the butcher because he's probably impressed that you're, uh, that you, you want to learn more about meat. Right. And you also, ironically might be eating healthier by getting fat scraps that have some meat in them and and eating those than you would be buying really expensive lean steaks and things yeah it's kind of kind of an irony yeah i think that we we tend to get a little bit focused on grass fed beef and all this kind of thing and and heavily marbled wagyu steaks and that's the fancy stuff but mm. but you don't need to to spend that kind of money to eat healthily You'll probably get 90% of the way there just by getting regular meat with uh, a fair amount of fat involved. And maybe you go from 90% to 91% by getting grass-fed meat. And, you know, if those cheaper meats are too lean, you know, that's when your fat scraps can come in. And, and yeah. seriously, just tell your butcher, uh, you could either tell them you're doing this ketogenic diet, tell them you have a dog, whatever you want to say. Mm. And they're probably happy because they throw out a lot of trimmed fat. Yeah. They, they just throw it in the garbage can. You say, look, I'll buy that from you. Now they're like, oh, wow, cool. Yeah. yeah. So the, the nice thing about this thread was that uh, basically all of our helpful members of the of the forum jumped in and, and offered suggestions. We had one from Eli who said, I don't know if this is possible in your neck of the woods, but I try to go to the grocery store late when the deli section is closing down. Yeah. Often they'll have rotisserie set, uh, chicken that hasn't sold and they sell it for just a couple of bucks. Uh, my husband and I pull the meat off that and we'll have some over a green salad one day, mix some with mayo another day for a chicken salad, have some by itself, and I boil up the bones and such to make a broth. Uh, again, I don't know if you have a store close that does that, but I have found that that saves me a lot of money. I do this once a week or so, and my husband is six foot eight, and I tease him that he has a hollow leg, so it isn't always enough. Yeah. Soup in general has saved us many times, chicken stock and low-carb veggies. Right. It's not exciting, but it fills you up. Oh, and you might have luck uh, talking to the produce manager. I talked with one here, and the produce that they're getting ready to pull usually ends up at my home. Avocados, they're getting too ripe, slightly wilted spinach or bruised peppers. It's all usable for me, but it is in perfect condition. So uh, the store has been great to let me know when they when they have and to give me super good deals, and that 
might be worth a shot. Sometimes they get spinach for like 30 cents or avocados for 25 cents, you know, the smaller ones. So it's a bit hit and miss, but. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Now, I, I, we had a store in Bateman's Bay that every Thursday around about midday, they'd bring a trolley out with all of the, that they'd have, uh, uh, they'd have uh, shopping bags full of mixed vegetables and they'd just give these things away for like 50 cents or so um and there's you get a lot of carby vegetables in them but you know sometimes but uh you know if you pick the right ones you get some uh, good bargains right and kim chimed in with uh, eggs are probably the least expensive protein probably true uh yeah. somebody yeah. mentioned somewhere on the internet that they go to walmart and get five dozen eggs for like seven bucks wow and it's a very eggs are a very complete nutritious source. So, you know, if you right. can add eggs to your diet, you're you're adding a lot of nutritional options. Right. Tom Seast, uh, another one of our admins, said organ meats are another bargain. Most people don't like to eat liver, heart, and other organ meats. These are loaded with great nutrients and are usually available inexpensively. And Tom. You're absolutely right. When we talked to Nina Teicholz, mm, yeah. she she informed us something we knew, but you know, neither of us like beef liver. But it is the most nutritious meat that you can buy, and she hides it in meatballs and gives yeah. it to her kids. <laughs> So, Teresa says, bacon ends and chicken leg quarters. Tuna in oil is about 70 cents a can. I buy big blocks of, uh, of tuna in oil from, uh, from Costco, and that's a really great source of optional protein when, you, when you're yeah. uh, low on protein for the day. That uh, is a good way of doing it. Um, cabbage, is, cabbage is cheap. If you have an Aldi where you are, they have great prices on eggs, sour cream, cream cheese, and butter. Um, also, they have uh, cheap summer sausage and mixed nuts. Interesting. Yeah, I guess it's just a matter of, of finding those things. Maybe a dollar store might have mixed nuts for a dollar a can. That's a good yeah, idea. Yeah, that's true. Bacon ends I've never heard of. And then uh, I started uh, asking around, and you're right. You can go to your butcher again, or the deli sometimes will sell bacon ends, which are all just sort of fat. You know, they don't yeah. they don't really sell them all that well. Yeah, I, I, I chop those up into, sometimes they call them lardons, and I chop those up, I dice mm. them into very small one centimeter dices, and before I cook a meal, I fry a couple of those in a pan, and that that basically renders down the fat to become the fat in the di- in the meal, and the little bits of uh, of connective tissue that are left that end up becoming crunchy little croutons. It's delicious, really good. Mm-hmm. So uh, another thing that she mentioned: uh, chicken leg quarters. It turns out the chicken thighs in the leg quarters are yeah. probably the cheapest pieces of uh, chicken that you can get because everybody wants the breasts. Everybody yeah, wants the right. lean meat. And that's yeah. the worst. That's the worst made, in my opinion. Chicken wings are also very expensive because people know that they like them. Mm. If you're looking for a cheap uh, source of bone and cartilage to make broth with, maybe chicken paws would be better. What's a chicken paw? Chicken paws are the feet. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know you can get in Australia. You can get uh, you can get wing wings that are three quarter wings, which are wings with the tips cut off. And you can, if you go to the shop at the right time, you can get all of the tips that they're just going to throw out. And the tips are the parts with all the cartilage in and everything, and they mm-hmm. obviously have skin on it. And that's going to be uh, that's going to render when you make a stock. That's going to render down into gelatin. So that's a that's a wonderful source of protein. Yeah. The other thing I like is you can get chicken frames which. Which is the chicken carcass that's had all of the all of the saleable pieces of meat taken off? And the other day we bought four chicken frames for like seven bucks. So, uh, and that's gonna that's gonna go to make um, probably about twenty liters of stock. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that's that's amazing. Uh, Alyssa Schmidt says I'm able to get frozen chicken thighs from butchers here in my town for eighty nine cents a pound. Wow, they are my go to bargain protein. How about that? They taste so much better. Oh, yeah. So Liz says, I was broken on my ancestral Appalachian diet of soup, beans, cornbread, ham, and oatmeal when I first went paleo back in 2012. My budget was super tight, so I made lots of good soups, chili, ate fried eggs for breakfast and for dinner, and would usually do a casserole. I could portion out and freeze. Then again, I was a single female, so didn't have an entire family to support. So there's a lot of options. Like soup beans are quite carby. Obviously, you don't want cornbread um, and oatmeal, but uh, the um, soups are a really uh, good way of uh, building nutritious 
um, meals. So um, I highly recommend uh, certainly building your own stocks. You can create vegetable stocks from vegetable ends. Um, you can obviously create meat stocks from uh, from bones and from carcasses. So, Vicky Foley says something else to look for is food resale. Interesting. I've got a friend here with a tiny store. In Texas, we had a huge one that sold all kinds of frozen meat they got from stores that overbought. They have to be specifically certified to handle and process stuff, but it saved us tons of money. Yeah, Brenda suggests you know if the meat is close to its use by date, go and have a chat to the the produce manager and see if you can get them to mark it down. And often they will mark it down. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and I think that just basically the thing we're saying is. Go to your supermarket, go to your butcher and establish a relationship yeah. and tell them what you're doing and the kinds of things that you want and that you're not worried about the way things look. And they, you, you may be surprised. They may say, okay, well, back the truck up. Yeah. You know, because we've got some food for you. Yeah, that's right. I, I the other thing is that if you have the option, growing your own food is a very cheap way of, uh, of feeding yourself. Um, so, for example, if you've just got an apartment, you've maybe got a veranda, you can get pots and put herbs in the pots. And mm -hmm. it, herbs make an, a, a, make a significant contribution to the taste of your food, uh, and it's very cheap. And all you need is sunlight and water, right? And some seeds. Yeah, that's right. And actually, you can buy herb plants that are already potted and growing right. in your supermarket, sometimes right in the produce section. What's great about that is you can just keep them alive on your windowsill and use a little bit at a time. And you'll, you know, one plant might last you all summer. Yeah, that's true. So uh, the other thing you can do is there's some vegetables like spinach is really easy to grow. Uh, if you're Australian, there's a spinach called warrigal greens. It's a native spinach that is almost a weed. And uh, so, you know, that grows really easily. Um, uh, but, but yeah, silver beet, spinach, all those leafy greens, uh, you can grow those in a planter box. So that's uh, that's a good way of contributing to your nutrition. Yeah, Vivian says, I've noticed a butcher special section in the meat department of some groceries where they have the older meats on drastically reduced prices. I pick out the best and fattiest ones and cook and or freeze immediately. A little oxidation doesn't hurt. Yeah. Let me just speak to that. Hmm. How do you, you know, what's the difference between a little oxidation and spoiled meat? Right. Basically, here's the story. If you take a steak fresh from the butcher, bring it home, put it in the fridge for a week. You know, it's going to turn gray. Yeah. And it turns out that's the perfect time to eat that steak. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you, that's how you age a steak. You put it on a rack on a, on a plate in your fridge and you leave it there for a week and that it, the fridge dries it out a little bit and that's how you age right. a steak. Well, it's one Absolutely. Way. Now you might be concerned about the health aspects of it, but listen, if you're using salt and you're cooking it up to temperature, there's no bacteria in there no. that is going to harm you. That question you need to ask is, does it taste funky? Right. Yeah. Right. And that's, yeah. So you'll be able to cook anything pretty mm. much and eat it. Yeah. You can even scrape off the funk and, mm. uh, and cook it. And it's still not going to kill you. You're not going to, if you cook it thoroughly, it's going to be fine. It's just how much funk can you stand? Yeah. That's the question. The thing is that bacteria doesn't go into a muscle. So, um, this is why, um, mincemeat is, uh, more likely to have bacteria because it's got more surface area, um, mm. that could be potentially exposed to bacteria. A slab of steak has only got the outer surfaces that could be exposed to bacteria that could be right. growing a, growing a, a colony. And so um, what you can do is you can carve off the outer pieces of a, of a large piece of meat and the inner pieces should be fine. You can also wash meat. There's nothing wrong with washing meat and nope. drying it off with a paper towel, you know. Um, wash it in a bit of, bit of um, uh, warm water and then, uh, and then put it on a searing hot plate and there's very few bacteria going to survive past that. And if you add the salt trick that I gave you at the beginning of this segment, yeah, salt kills most bacteria. Mm. So not only does it make it tender and tasty, but you're actually, uh, you know, getting rid of the little little buggy guys. Yeah, that's true. So I've got one from Chris who said that a lot of processed food appears cheap, but in terms of dollars per kilo, they're more expensive than fresh whole foods. Rubbish like corn chips are over forty dollars a kilo in Australia and virtually nutrient free. That's a good point because uh, every time somebody has to do a process to your food, 
there's a wage involved and that's going to increase the cost of that food. And eventually, most of the cost of the, of the food that arrives on your plate is probably going into the, the wages of all of the people responsible for getting that food to your plate and very little is mm. involved in the, the raw materials that made it. So the closer you can go back to the raw materials of the food – the better you are. And if you've got a bit of money, you can get a whole half a cow and get a butcher just to <laughs> carve it up and just have a large freezer full. But that's not an option for most people. That's right. For about $20 in Australia you can get from Costco, you can get a large bolar roast of uh, a two-kilo bolar roast. It's part of the shoulder uh, joint of a, of a, of a cow. And um, you can throw that – so that's two kilos for about $20. You can throw that in a slow cooker with uh, some bay leaves, a little bit of thyme, a little bit of onion, and mm. a little bit of water or stock and – just cook it for 12 hours. And at the end of that process, get a couple of forks in, pull it up. You can bag bag it up into portions. And you're probably going to get a, a portion of meat or a meal for a plate was probably about 100 grams of, of meat. You could probably get 20 meals out of that. Uh, it's not large meals, mm. but, you know, that's a, that's a dollar a meal uh, in terms of your protein. And then, you know, um, leafy greens, if you're growing your own on your windowsill or, you know, you, you're getting uh, cheap access to leafy greens, you could in theory get – a fairly decent keto meal for two or three bucks. So, but it mm. takes it, it takes a bit of work. You've got to basically go back in the process to uh, to the beginning of the process and work with the raws of materials. Yeah, and I'm going to bring it home just by saying that. Uh, as we have mentioned earlier in the show, your appetite goes down. You naturally eat less. My grocery bill, even though I eat prime ribs and things once in a while, my grocery bill has gone down dramatically. And it's yeah. because I don't eat as much as I used to. Yeah. So you, you are really in a good position to get healthy, eat well not be hungry and spend a lot less money and create a lot less trash as well and create a lot less trash that's another thing that we're mm. our, our trash can was full and overflowing and now there's one bag a week right. yeah it's unbelievable so yeah. you know all of these things come together to 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 say that keto is probably the most budget friendly diet that you can go on and hopefully these other suggestions will help you take it to the next level yeah. So I, I recommend to people come and join us in the Facebook group. And there's an awesome bunch of people out there who just want to help. And uh, this thread is a perfect example, you know. Yeah, they were all awesome. Um, I can't say enough about the people in our group. They're, they're wonderful. We try to keep the trolls out for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and we haven't had that much of a problem. It's a great group and a great bunch of people. FB.2keto.com. Yeah. All right, I think it's time for uh, some recipes. Some recipes. You save, you do for a little. Recipes. Recipes. Let's do recipes. some recipes. <laughs> Let's do some recipes. Ah, da, 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 da. Da, da, da. So, <laughs> what have what have you got for us today, Carl? Well, Richard, today I've got a staple at my house that I've been doing since even before I went keto, and that is okay. beer can chicken. Mmm, beer can chicken. <laughs> beer can chicken. <laughs> Lay it on me, it's, Carl. How do you make a beer can? How do you turn how a beer you, can First into of all, have you ever heard of beer can chicken? I have seen videos of it. Uh, it's basically okay. when you stick a beer can up a chicken's jacksy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, you set the chicken down on a half empty can of beer on the grill and oh, slow so, cook it. So it's half empty. So the beer actually yeah. go, goes into the cavity. I thought it was like a, a, a sealed can. No, no, so, no. Oh, okay. No, that would be crazy. That would explode. <laughs> well, I've always thought it yeah, was a you, bit crazy. <laughs> so the rustic way to do this is to take a can of beer, any beer, and mm -hmm. you know either pour out or drink half of it and put the other half down on the grill, uh, indirect heat, and put the, a well-seasoned chicken over it so it's sitting, like you said, right mm -hmm. on the can. The can right. is inside the bird. Mm-hmm. And then you you cook this over indirect heat, uh, you know, as long as it takes to get tender and juicy. Mm. The problem with the rustic way is that all the drippings go into your grill. And all if right. you have a gas grill like mine, you know, that mm. can be a, a nasty. So uh, you can go to Williams Sonoma or a kitchen place, or I'll actually get give you a link to a, a, a small plate that has a 
can sort of cavity in the middle. Oh, it's nice. made for beer can chicken. And so it's got a lip that will catch all the juices. You got it. It's nice. a plate with a lip that catches the juices yeah. and you can put the beer in the middle and, uh, and I've got that. So everybody has their different rubs for, you know, yeah. chicken on the grill. And this is but one suggestion, but this is a food network recipe and it's highly rated. And this is the one I use. One teaspoon of kosher salt, one teaspoon of paprika or smoked paprika, mm -hmm. one teaspoon of finely chopped rosemary, a teaspoon of dried thyme, a half a teaspoon of lemon zest, and a half a teaspoon of uh, fresh ground black pepper. So you get a roasting chicken, about four pounds, you, uh, some extra virgin olive oil on that, you get the beer, some fresh rosemary, some garlic. Basically, you mix the rub ingredients in a bowl and you lightly rub the chicken all over with olive oil and then season the chicken inside and out with the rub. Right. As I said before, you open your beer can, drink half of it or whatever, mm -hmm. and you put rosemary, thyme, and garlic and lemon juice into the beer. This is an optional step, but it adds a sort of effervescent flavor to the whole thing. Nice. Yep. And so then you grill over indirect medium heat, which is 350 to 450 degrees Fahrenheit until the juices run clear and the internal temperature reaches 180 degrees Fahrenheit in the breast about one and a quarter to one and a half hours. Then let the chicken rest for about 10 minutes before removing it from the beer can and you cut it up and it is the best barbecue roast chicken I've ever had. Wow. And, you know, another thing that I like to add to rubs and or the oil beforehand yeah. is some liquid smoke. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because then you mm. get the sort of barbecue effect of smoking. Sure. But without, without actually having to smoke. Um, you can also just use a regular box smoker with some uh, water-soaked wood chips and put that over the heat. Yeah. And put that right on the flame so you can yeah. smoke it at the same time. I I bought myself a smoking gun. I think I think I told you the other day, and I'm just smoking. Mm. All the, I'm smoking all the things. The other day I smoked butter. <laughs> <laughs> you should never smoke butter, kids. It's not good for your lungs. <laughs> so so that's an awesome recipe. I'm going to actually try um, mounting a chicken on a beer can and see how that goes. So what do you have, Richard? So I've got collie tots, which are like tater tots, but they're a low carb version, and they're made out of cauliflower. So we start off with uh, some cauliflower and we remove the, the leaves and the, and the ends of the stalk from the cauliflower and we cut it up into some fairly evenly sized pieces and then, mm. and then place them into a food processor and we blend them until it's reasonably smooth. So we're basically taking the, uh, the cauliflower florets and turning them into a, a coarse grain powder. And yeah. To that, we're going to add mozzarella, egg, some salt, and we'll blend well until it's combined. And basically what you end up with then is kind of like a wet dough. It doesn't quite hold together very well. The egg is going to hold it together a little bit. But So, so you, yeah. you, you take these and you form them into tater tot size pieces, and then you roll them in finely grated Parmesan cheese mm. uh, to cover them, and you place them directly on, on a baking tray lined with a bit of baking paper. And you can spray them with uh, uh, coconut oil spray or, or uh, other oil sprays um, to help them uh, crisp up a little bit. And you bake them in the oven for 15 minutes at 200 Celsius or about 400 Fahrenheit. And keep an eye on them because uh, they'll go a lovely golden color, but if they're left in too long, obviously they'll go brown. Uh, so that makes that makes uh, tater tots, low carb tater tots, and you can serve those with the uh, the KFC, the low carb KFC that I that I uh, <laughs> recipe that I did the other day. That is outstanding. I can't wait to do that. I saw that on your blog last year, and I thought, yeah. oh, I really got to do that. And then I, <laughs> you know, I've only made cauliflower mashed potatoes, garlic mash once. Yeah, I really liked it. My kids not so much, but I really really loved it. Yeah, cauliflower is a real grown-up flavor, but uh, I find it's delicious. As, as a rice substitute, I make uh, risottos out of cauliflower rice. or you made I jambalaya out of Jambalaya out of, uh, out of cauliflower rice. Um, I think, actually, the jambalaya, I use a shirataki rice, but you can use, right. a, you can use a cauliflower rice, a, a riced cauliflower. Um, and That's right. There's also a recipe that I'll do in a future podcast uh, making wraps out of cauliflower. cauliflower wow, yeah. wraps. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a show. 
This was a good one. Yeah, I think it'll be, I think there's a lot of good, useful information. So, uh, of course, if you have anything that you want to tell us, something we said wrong, something you don't agree with, or some more research that you found to support or refute anything we've said, send it by email to dudes at twoketodudes.com or just post it on our website or come and visit us in the Facebook group. Or send us a tweet. Our Twitter handle is Two Keto Dudes. Yep. Easy. And... Uh, and our Facebook group again is fb.2keto.com. Our gear store is at gear.2keto.com where you can get a t shirt that proudly says, Show me the science. <laughs> and of course, if you want to sign up to know more about Keto Fest, which is happening next year, yeah. I swear to God, yeah. go to ketofest.com. Awesome. All right. We'll see you next time on Two Keto Dudes. Yeah.